Ha ha, day one. <laughs> day one of what, you might ask. Day one of really being sober with food. This is going to sound, if you're not a compulsive eater, if you don't do like this whole 12-step program, then this is not a video for you. But I have major food issues. Like, it's not, actually, I'm saying that totally wrong. I don't have issues with food. I have issues with me, and I use food to mask my issues with myself. <laughs> I have issues with self-loathing. I have issues with boundaries. I have issues with being present with myself, issues with being still. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't have issues with food. I use food inappropriately. So I've been really working on that over the last several um, weeks, like being aware of it, becoming more and more aware of it. But I, I just, I hit a big, um, well, really a big divot. It was a chance for awakening. It's a chance for me to actually, to come into a real relationship with myself and to have a real healthy relationship with food. So I ended up having some problems. Um, like I, I had some internal issues that were coming forth. I could feel it in my stomach. Literally my stomach became like a stone. It was really wild. And it was speaking to me saying, look, <laughs> I need you to stop ignoring me. I need you to, to hear me. Otherwise, you might have some real health issues. My heart would race. I could feel my pulse in my head. I could hear it. So high blood pressure. Oh my God, I've never confronted anything like this before in my life. So this thing is happening. And this thing is happening. This thing is happening. And I realized I got to do something about my food. So I've decided that I have to um, use a combination of things to actually help me come into integrity with food. And earlier, at the beginning of the year, in January, I wrote down my goals. And one of the goals that I wrote was that I want to be in integrity with my body. So I want to exercise. And when I exercise, I don't want to just go run 10 miles and then do two minutes of stretching and then be like, oh, great, I'm done. And then limp around and be like, oh, yeah, exercise. You know, it's hard. I'm sore. No, that's not being in integrity. <laughs> so I said, okay, when I exercise, I want to give as much care and love to caring for my body as I do to working my body. Same thing with my meditations. I want to actually be present with my meditations. When I eat, I want to be present with my food and eating. So the eating, the exercising has actually been surprisingly easy. I've actually been managing to do some yoga and to be loving to my body after I work out. No problem. Seeing the benefits of that. But the food, I couldn't. I, I haven't been able to get a ha handle on it. And this last weekend, there was a full moon eclipse, and I was made aware of, of deep emotional issues that I had been masking, avoiding, suppressing, and denying. So, you all know me. If you've been watching my videos, you know I talk a lot about emotions, and you're like, what are you masking, suppressing, and denying? Well, <laughs> I talk so much about it, right? Well, actually... There's still more in there, and there are some key issues that I've been masking, suppressing, and denying for all of my life. I started compulsive eating when I was a, a kid. You know, I was a latchkey kid. I was alone. I felt lonely. I felt sad. I didn't like myself. I didn't like my life. When I was nine years old, I tried to commit suicide. What nine-year-old tries to commit suicide? And I was serious, too. I went into the, the cabinet. I took all these pills. And there was an angel that came. I mean, I'm calling it an angel. But there was somebody who tapped me on my shoulder when I was, when I was falling asleep into this really weird sleep of, like, deep sleep. 
somebody tapped me on my shoulder and was like, get up. And then I felt myself, somebody push on my stomach and I went into the bathroom and I threw up like I felt like I was throwing up forever. <laughs> anyway, so this shows you, <laughs> you see me, I'm laughing. I've got a lot of joy in my life, but my being feels emotions and experiences emotions at a really deep level. Not everybody does this. I, I know that I am out of balance. It is really work for me to actually be in balance with my emotions. And believe it or not, I actually do a pretty good job of it, which is why you know I'm able to actually show up here. But it's an internal process where I feel just way too much. Not too much. I don't feel too much. I just feel everything, and I don't know how to manage it. And I never knew, learned how to manage it. When I was a kid, I didn't have boundaries. Talked about this in my last video. But with me now, as an adult, I haven't managed those, those deep emotions. And I've done some things to correct them and to find peace and love with myself, to find acceptance within myself. But now it's time for a surge. This is a very powerful year. We're in a one year. This is a year of authority. So this is the year where the part of me that has authority, that has strength, that has power, wants to come forth and say, hey, let's, let's rock this. Let's rock our life. And the part of me that, that is in resistance to authority, even in resistance to the authority that is within me, resistant to authority in the world, you know, a rule breaker, someone who doesn't like boundaries, resists authority. So that part of me wants to resist the authority that is natural within myself. So the emotional me is also at war with herself. The authoritative self wants to come through now. It's like, all right, look, you've had the last cycle of nine years to be an emotional wreck. Now it's time for you to own the wifery, the life force energy that exists in you, but not to let it run you. It's now time for you to actually run your own life. It's time for you to take responsibility for yourself, to stop blaming your mother, to stop blaming society, to stop blaming the president, to take full responsibility for yourself, and to get control of those emotions that are making you crazy. And there are so many things that are going well this year, like I'm writing a lot, I feel the flow, I feel so much confidence, I feel like I'm going to have my three books written by the end of the year, I'm actually working on them every day, and it's a blessing. The thing is, the food, you know, and so the food cried out this week, and it was like, and again, it's not the food itself, it's how I use the food. Even now, you can see, I keep going to the food, like it's the food, well, it's because I don't really have a name for the real thing that's, I guess the real thing is that I'm hungry. When I was a kid, I started getting really hungry for attention, hungry for life, hungry for sex, hungry for affection. And I lived in an environment where I was basically by myself for at least eight hours every day. I'd go to school, and I didn't get a lot of love from school because I moved around. Sometimes I attended three schools in one year. And to show up like that, you don't develop relationships. I didn't develop relationships. I would show up, have to get adjusted, and then it would be on to the next thing, you know? And even when I was in school, I was missing school all the time. So I didn't have, like, a place where I felt like I belonged except within the, the context of whatever home I had. And thank God I had a home. My mom was able to provide me with a home. Never felt unsafe from predators outside of my home, except the predator that lived within my home, who was an authority, who was my mom. Now, my mom was a subtle predator. She was, you know, she loved me. I, I don't have doubt about that, but she was narcissistic. And she stepped ba over boundaries with me all the time. Now, if you told her that, if you had, somebody had taught her what she was doing, I know that she would not have done it. She would have worked on herself and fixed it. But at the time when I was coming up, it just wasn't available to her. And she was working to try to put, you know, a roof over our heads and 
Uh, anyway, all of that is to say that the authority that is within me doesn't know how to exist without opposition, or rather, I said that wrong. The authority in me does not exist without opposition to it. The opposition to it when I was a child came from my mother. When I tried to assert myself, my mom suppressed me. Like if she didn't like what I was doing or if I went against her, if I expressed myself in any way that she felt was a threat and, and basically everything I did was a threat to her, I wasn't attractive enough, I wasn't smart enough. All these things, my being was a threat to my mom's existence because she's narcissistic. She saw me as being an extension of her and wanted to control every aspect of myself. So for me to have authority in the face of that was really, really, really impossible because partially my personality is a people pleaser. I'm not able to actually like let people be pissed off at me. When people are pissed off at me, I shrink and reshape myself to conform to them. So my own natural authority that says, hey, I'm me, I have a right to be here, never got developed. Or it would get developed not from within by me saying I have authority from within myself, but rather I get authority by things I did on the outside. So when I made good grades in school, that gave me a sense of pride. So I'd focus on school or when people um, uh, praised the way I speak because as a kid, I had a, a good way of speaking. I could communicate in a very precise manner and people would, um, would you know, kind of really praise me for that and they'd listen and they'd take interest in me because I was a little kid who was really articulate and had, you know, a good mind that could express things but I was also a charming kid. So as much as I hated myself as a kid, you know, I had a way of flowing with the charm. So my authority did not come from real authority that was in. Within, it came from authority that was on the outside, getting praise from outside. And because I was never, I never validated myself as a being who was willing, who was worthy of being here unless other people said that I was. So when I didn't have that praise, I sunk into a phase of I need praise. I need to know that I'm worthwhile here, otherwise I need to die, which is why I would commit suicide at or try to commit suicide at the age of nine or commit suicide by eating until I feel like I want to explode. And I started that as a kid, you know? So now here I am, this adult who is finally who's worked on herself and now has a semblance of self-love. Now it's time for the next step. In what ways am I expressing my self-love? I'm taking my vitamins. I get enough sleep. I have a refrigerator full of food that's actually really, really, really healthy. I binge eat. I compulsively eat, but I compulsively eat on locally grown organic food that I make myself. So it's really healthy. But let me tell you something, 2,500 calories of good food, organic food, is the same as 2,500 calories of other food. 2,500 calories is 2,500 calories when it's too much for your system. When you don't need it, you're going to get fat. doesn't matter if it's organic or not. You could have grown all that stuff. It's 2,500 calories of tomatoes is 2,500 calories. And my body's expanding. So my authority wants to be expressed. And so now I'm actually looking at the thing that my spirit is saying needs to come next. And that is my need for um, a relationship with food. Well, actually, it has to do with relationships in general. So I've not been in relationship for a year. And it's Partially, it doesn't really matter why, but it, it does matter. Um, it does matter because my relationship with food is reflective of my relationship with um, other people, with intimate romantic relationships in particular. I treat my partners the way I treat food. And 
that's just the way it is. You know, it's the way I am. I'm, I have a narcissistic personality. And so my work is to now recover that part of myself that actually knows how to have a good relationship with food and knows how to have a good relationship with men. And to be a good friend, by the way. But the romantic and the food kind of go more hand in hand. I'm a pretty good friend. I listen to my friends. I can do that. But I feel safe with my friends. I don't feel safe with men. And I don't feel safe with food. So, <laughs> so well, I should say I don't feel safe with life force energy. And food is a form of life force energy. Life force energy is God. But that's getting a little bit more complicated. That's for another video. But I don't feel safe with God. I don't trust him. So... Life force energy in the force in the uh, in the form of food, yeah. There's some issues. So my my job right now is to come to a new relationship and a new understanding of food, so that I can also eventually come to a new understanding of myself in relationships rom that are of a romantic and intimate nature. So um, what I'm doing right now is I'm using discipline and um, because I do very well when I have discipline and structure. So I'm using discipline and I'm also allowing a sense of flow along with the discipline. So one of the things that I learned in Overeaters Anonymous is that um, there's this idea of being sober with food. And being sober with food is, this, is similar to being sober with alcohol. With Alcoholics Anonymous, it's more extreme because alcohol is an option in our lives. Food is not an option in our lives, so it's got to be a little different. With Alcoholics Anonymous, the rule is no drinking, <laughs> right? So I've been sober. I've been without a drink for 90 days, you know? With food, you can't go 90 days without food. You shouldn't. You could, I suppose, but that wouldn't be good. But with food, it's different. So you have to establish a, a boundary, a game plan, like a background rules with food. And being sober, sober then becomes, well, I honored, I stuck to the ground rules with food. And that determines your sobriety. So for myself, um, I've set up ground rules. And my ground rules are this, because I do have a goal of, losing weight, um, I am going to limit my calories to 1,400 calories when I do nothing, right? So because I'm a writer and because I'm a coach, I sit in a chair literally for 9 to 10 hours a day. So that's my day. So I don't even have the option because I work from home. I don't have the option of walking from my car to my job, going up the stairs to get to my office. Everything is here. I'm in my bed or I'm in a chair. So um, for me, my lifestyle is really sedentary. So I have to, you know, in order to maintain weight, um, my... I looked at my BMI, I think it's the BMI, it just tells you how many calories you burn just from being still. And according to my BMI, I burn about 1,400 calories. So if I just sit still and do nothing but breathe, then my body's going to burn 1,400 calories. That's why I have that as a baseline. So 1,400 calories a day. And there's the discipline. Now the looseness is, if I go over a couple of calories, it's okay. It's but I'm going to watch it, right? Because I need to develop a new relationship with myself. I have to be a little bit super cautious right now because, because I've abused my body and because I've abused my relationship with food, my body, and I, because I've not listened, I've ignored my body for the last 47 or 40 years about what, when it's had enough, I don't know when I've had enough. So I have to relearn what is enough. So 1,400 calories, I break down my um, meals into three meals, or four meals, three meals and a snack. 
because I, I do feel like I like to have a little break and a snack. So I have breakfast at 300 calories, lunch at 400 calories, snack at 100 calories, and dinner at 500 calories. I said that wrong. Shit. I have it written down. It's breakfast at 400 calories, lunch at, lunch at 400 calories, snack at 100 calories, and dinner at 500 calories. Okay, so there's my 1,400 calories. Now, the thing is, if I go take a walk in my neighborhood, I get to add on the calories that I burn from walking to my calorie intake. So don't go thinking that I'm just going to be totally restrictive and I'm stuck at 1,400 calories. I run it. I go out and I'll run six miles, and at my rate, you know, when I'm when I'm using my monitor, I will burn in a in a six mile run. I'll burn, let's say, 750 calories. Well, that's those are calories that I get to consume. So when I do those runs, I can do that. If I do a three mile run, blah blah blah. When I take a walk, and I should be walking every day, right? Just doing 10,000 steps a day is a wonderful way to like get yourself moving to get myself moving and to get more calories that I could actually consume if I need to. The thing is, so sobriety for me is about making sure that I honor the caloric intake and while I'm taking in my calories, I have to listen to my body. Am I actually eating more than my body is saying that it wants? Like a stomach is only supposed to hold like this much food. And if my plate is this big and I'm eating all this, then I'm not, you know, I'm putting too much in that more than my body can handle. So I don't know all this stuff intuitively like other people would know it. So I have to relearn it. So I'm relearning it by taking small portions at a time and listening and seeing what it feels like. So that's my practice. And I'm starting this today and I decided that I want to make a daily check-in video for myself to keep as another way of keeping myself accountable to this um, to this loving life affirming process. For me, it feels good, and I just had breakfast, and I had Jesus. What I would normally have for breakfast, I'm going to tell you, I would normally have two eggs and some toast, and maybe I'd eat. Um, a quarter pound of steak and maybe then after about an hour of eating that I'd follow it up with a bowl of muesli. Now if any of you know calories you would know that that alone is probably about a thousand calories right there already just with breakfast and then I'd start on lunch maybe three hours later right. Um, so what I had for breakfast this morning were two scrambled eggs and um, maybe an, uh, about an eighth of a baguette, which is about that much, about this much bread, right? And with butter and jam. Now, I, I weighed this out because every morning I write down what I'm going to eat each day. So I know breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I count the calories. And I have to convince myself, because you're dealing with somebody who's got a mental disorder in this moment, I have to write it down and then I have to, I have to talk to myself about why two eggs and this much baguette with butter and jam is enough. Why the 400 calories, it came out to 402 calories, I have to explain to myself, parent myself, and tell myself why that's enough, and to help myself feel like that is enough. So I feel like a little bit like a basket case, but it's the way to do it. I'm not going to take pills and suppress my appetite. I'm not going to drink coffee or tea and get that caffeine high and suppress my appetite. That's not doing it. For me, it's about self-love, self-loving myself to a place where I actually can feel the love from within because I'm not eating because I'm greedy. That doesn't really exist for me. Maybe it exists for other people, but I don't think so. I think that greed is insecurity. It's fear of not having enough, fear of people taking away from you, fear of you being, being inferior. I think that's what compulsive eating is. 
you know? Greed is. Really, it's about needing to feel valuable and worthy as you are in the world. And I feel like if I treat myself like that, I'm going to be okay. Now, I've just had breakfast. And I have to say that there was this kind of weird emotional thing where I got to the last bite and I was like, oh, shit, it's the last bite. What am I going to do? And I loved myself. And I said, all right, I got to the last bite. And how do I feel? And I thought, well, that breakfast was really good. The eggs here in France are so delicious. Food here in France is just delicious. I had some butter on my toast with jam. It was enjoyable. The baguette was awesome. It was warm, you know, toasted. I got a lot of pleasure from that breakfast. And I just sat there and, and enjoyed it. And I survived. So I'm going to go to my sober counter because I'm writing how often I'm, like, I'm keeping count of how long I've been sober. That was a sober breakfast for me. So I've been sober since 10 o'clock. I want to cry because it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I've been sober since 10 o'clock last night. And it actually feels really empowering. Signing off because I don't feel like crying on YouTube today. So bye for now. We'll check in with you later. Please pray for me that I stay sober. Thank you.